Welcome to Strength Chat Podcast, presented by Kabuki Strength. Introducing your hosts, Chris Duffin, the mad scientist of strength, Rudy Cadlow, mature athlete and coach, and the wizard of training himself, Brandon Sen. Everybody believes I'm five foot four. <laughs> it's, it's like that's that's the view on the internet. And well, now here, you're reinforcing. Let me raise it. my chair up just that's a little beautiful. bit more. Even. All right, I'm gonna just sit down here like this. Okay. <laughs> All right. yeah, I'll lower my chair. I'll lower my all chair right. if it makes you feel he better. He is wider than he all is right. tall. All right, sure. we're, 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 ready to, we're ready to roll. All right. All, right. all right. Welcome to Strength Chat, here with the mad scientist of powerlifting, Chris Duffin, my partner, and mature coach and athlete, Rudy Cadlib, also the wizard in the closet, Brandon Sin. <laughs> and today... <laughs> We are really excited. Seriously, I'm really excited to be sitting down and talking with uh, Jeff Hallowby of Hallowby Life in New York City. So Jeff has a number of things going for him uh, besides uh, owning his own gym, but uh, he's a contributor to the uh, Today Show. Um, he is also an innovator in regards to bringing new, new products and also content to the market. So he's working on seminar series and just helping people bring great things to the market. And one of the things I really respect about Jeff is that he's got this broad, broad reach in the fitness world. A lot of us that like specialize in fitness don't really have the reach that he does, but he actually knows his shit. Like he promotes good methods and I can get behind the guy and I love what he's doing and promoting. And uh, so Jeff, can you start out with telling us uh, a little bit more bes about yourself besides uh, my, my, my brief little intro here? I don't know if I can top what you just said. You just killed it. Look <laughs> Anything at this point is going to be a step down from that. Well, thank you very okay, much. Okay, we're done then. <laughs> thank you very much for having me, guys. Um, yeah, honestly, um, that was that was a great intro. Thank you very much for the kind words. Um, what I will say is that uh, I um, I'm constantly honored by a lot of fan mail that I get. Um, I do have a uh, you know aside from the Today Show, I have a um, a show called Workout from Within uh, that uh, just entered its fifth season. Uh, that airs in over 30 countries worldwide in over 10 languages. And I'm honestly touched. This isn't fluff. I'm touched when I get fan mail from places like Tunisia, Egypt, Romania. Uh, and all of a sudden I'm like, wow, like people are actually watching my show and they know what a Yanda sit up is because they watched my show. So we don't do these fluff, you know, six minute abs or whatever, you know, anybody's doing these days. We certainly don't do the Tracy Anderson method. Uh, <laughs> I'll, I'll, just be, I'll just be quiet over here. That's reassuring. Right, <laughs> Honestly, feel free to chime in. As a matter of fact, I'll take this opportunity. She's probably not even listening, but I'll take this opportunity to once again challenge her to a, a debate at the 92nd Street Y, $50,000 to debate the merits, the scientific merits of her methodology in front of a panel of exercise physiologists, $50,000 goes to the winner's charity of choice. Wow, how could you pass so, that up? Awesome, I, I, yeah, how well, can you pass that up? I mean, so, so Jeff, you, you opened that door, what would be your charity of choice? My charity, you know, that's a tough one. I honestly, like, I probably shouldn't say this, but but I will, because it's, it's, it's my own nonprofit that I'm starting. I'm, I'm starting something called the Raise the Bar Foundation, and uh, this probably is going to resonate with you guys, but we're uh, the the purpose of the Raise the Bar Foundation is to teach uh, underprivileged youth the sport of powerlifting. And um, the reason that I really feel so strongly about this is you really don't have to be you know quote unquote athletic in order to be an excellent powerlifter. So speed and agility aren't really uh, you know requisite uh, components of the sport. You can argue that you know speed and dynamic effort and all that stuff. Yeah, those come into those come into play. But the person who's the best guy in the basketball court or football field isn't necessarily going to be the best powerlifter, and vice versa. And uh, it really teaches youth that if they um, if they apply themselves and have a systematic approach to uh, training and um, do, you know repeating things, uh, not just for repetition's sake, but the right way. Um, that, uh, that, that things in life, you know, goals that you have in life actually become uh, ridiculously simple in many ways and they become predictable. And I think it will restore the faith 
that a lot of um, you know these uh, disadvantaged youth have um, with systems in their life, whether it's the educational system, the family unit, the family system, uh, once they're shown that by applying themselves over time using sound, proven principles, that they can create their own success. I think there's carryover into just about everything in life. Uh, and uh, then we're doing some really cool stuff with that. So we're getting, um, we're getting prizes for these kids. I always believe in having a carrot at the end of the stick. And then we're also getting um, uh, essential uh, school supplies uh, funded uh, for these disadvantaged youth. So we're talking about backpacks, you know, notebooks, pens and pencils, stuff that many people take for granted, but are just so key. And I know, you know, Chris, I, I happen to know your personal story. And, uh, you know, I, I know how important these things are and how easy it is to, 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 you know, to forget how crucial they are and how much they're needed when you just don't have them. Yeah, I mean, you're, you're speaking to me right now. I mean, this is like everything that you're saying is, is huge because it's, there's so much that you can apply from training to life, and that that that's huge. And we will provide a link uh, in our podcast post uh, to the to the charity that you're speaking to right here. And uh, my wife's a teacher as well, so definitely see a lot of this uh, on a regular basis. But to me, it's absolutely huge to learn that if you apply the work and discipline over time, you will realize results. Not not today. Maybe not tomorrow or two days from now, like this uh, this world we live in today that wants you know instant gratification. But you can determine your future, and you can learn that through lifting. And a lot of people don't realize that. Yeah, and kids can see that pretty quickly with lifting. With a good progressive resistance program, six weeks they can see a magnificent increase in in strength right off the bat. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, look, I can say this much that in in many ways. Um, I think athletics uh, saved my life quite literally. Um, you know, and, and it's funny, well, not so funny, but um, coming up on the um, 15th anniversary of uh, my uh, final rehab uh, and, and, and sobriety, um, and um, it actually does correspond to 9-11, as a matter of fact, too, totally by chance, but uh, I was, um, quite frankly, out partying um, the night of uh, September 10th, 2001, uh, came home at about four or five o'clock in the morning, actually home to my parents' house that I wasn't even allowed at at the time. Um, and uh, kind of threw the towel in because I had one of these moments where I realized that uh, the people I was hanging out with were not my friends. They were really dragging me down. I was doing a lot of stuff I didn't really want to be doing. And uh, my father was uh, kind enough to actually let me into the house uh, at around seven o'clock in the morning. And we talked and um, next thing that happened is, uh, you know, plane hit the World Trade Center. Uh, and then by the time that second plane hit, you know, I had one of those moments where I, you know, I just had this incredibly vivid thought where I, you know, it was just, you know, I just don't want to die, scumbag. Those were the, the words that went through my head. And, and since then, you know, I completely turned my life around and I haven't looked back. And as soon as I got out of rehab, um, you know, I was incredibly out of shape. I went to, to rehab in, uh, in upstate New York at the point, at that point in time, um, the way they, that they had it structured is you go through the, the rehab there and then as soon as you're, it's a three month program. And then as soon as you're out of the house, after these three months, it's called the St. Jude Retreat House. And I'll proudly, by the way, plug that because I think they do phenomenal work and, uh, and they saved my life. St. Jude being the patron saint of lost hope, and, uh, which I certainly had lost by that point in time. And um, as soon as I got out, they have you uh, uh, stay there and mentor people who are currently going through the house while you work in the community. So I was uh, working a masonry job, you know, nine to five, um, or more like seven to four or something like that, and uh, smoking about a, uh, a pack of Pall Malls unfiltered uh, every single day. That was my mom's uh, favorite, yeah. Yeah, yeah, they really, uh, you know, just smoking a cigarette wasn't enough. I wanted to make sure my lungs were toasted. So <laughs> uh, when I got, when I finally came back and I, I moved back in with my parents during a transitional period, uh, my father uh, really knew how to get to me, and he challenged, you know, that macho part of me and he said that he bet that I couldn't even jog a mile if I wanted to. And uh, about, I'd like to say three minutes, but it was probably 30 seconds into this, uh, this run together. Uh, I was hands on knees, coughing up along, and one of the thoughts that went through my head is like, I can't believe I'm gonna die of a heart attack now when I survived all this other crap that I had been doing. You know, so finally, like I'm on the right path and I'm gonna die being challenged running. But um, it, I, I turned the huge corner, I was humiliated, embarrassed, and, um, you know, at that point in time, I had stopped weighing myself. I was, you know, I'm, I'm just shy of six foot. 
Uh, much taller than Chris, by the way, who you can see is you know very low in that seat uh, right. Uh, I can tell you, <laughs> I'm sitting next to him. He's about five eight. I have this chair jacked up. Five three, like, five I'm three and I'm a half. Like, I'm like five foot, or, or sorry, four foot nine. Uh, <laughs> Chris and I have spent time with each other, and, and Chris is uh, Chris is my height. Um, so just just for the record, for all the for all the internet trolls out there. Um, but uh, but yeah, so I, I started uh, I started I stopped weighing myself when I was over two sixty. And uh, I don't know how high I went, but you know, I had like 38 inch waist, and it was, I was a mess. And uh, I started lifting again. I wrestled in high school, you know, so I was used to used to lifting. But I started lifting, started martial arts, uh, namely uh, Brazilian Jiu Jitsu and, and kickboxing, and uh, it completely changed everything for me. So I've, you know, personally lived this, and I know what that transformational process is like. And uh, it's just amazing because at that point in time too, I was on you know drugs for depression. And, uh, and um, as soon as I got in better shape, uh, quite literally changing my body chemistry through exercise, I just didn't need any of the medications I was on sure. anymore. It felt great, they went away. And uh, one of the things I speak all over the world about uh, wellness, um, just forget about how many pounds you can lift, just, just waking up um, happy and able to function every single day, which uh, you know a lot of people are lacking in their lives. And, I always say that the world's best antidepressant is exercise, and it's been proven already. You know, so uh, you know the research is out there. What is it? Three twenty-minute uh, sessions of aerobic exercise uh, each week were just as effective as an antidepressant. I think was the finding of the study not too many years ago. So um, you know, this is something everybody should be doing for a variety of reasons. But I've digressed like crazy, guys. Well, yeah, <laughs> we were talking about raising the bar, which is is great. I mean, it's great to know. Why and, and how you got there? So, are you starting that in the city? Is it is it emanating out of uh, Halavi Life or what? Yeah. So, so the plan is to uh, actually take this nationally. So, uh, actually, right now, I'd love to invite KSL to join us and you, Chris, to of course join us as well. Um, I think that we can do some really great stuff together. I didn't even know that your wife was a teacher. So, um, I think that this is something that that seems like uh, it would be a good fit for you. But we can chat about that offline. But uh, the idea is to uh, bring this program uh, to, um, to every city uh, all across the country. Uh, we, I, we are going to start right here in New York City. Uh, we're kicking off uh, very shortly, as a matter of fact, with some of our fundraising efforts. And uh, we do have uh, on board with us, I'm very honored, uh, but we have uh, Kevin Oak on board with us, um, name that I'm sure you're all familiar with. And, I'm, uh, you know, I'm a little familiar with Kevin. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, he's he's a good guy, and uh, he um, he quite frankly, I, I shot him an email just explaining it to to him, and uh, he wrote back in like two minutes. He's like, I'm in. So uh, I think this really resonates with a lot of us who maybe have overcome certain difficulties ourselves, and just seen the value in uh, in training and applying yourself towards that end goal. And um, that's why I think it's so important to do something like this. Well, this nonprofit is is really a fantastic idea. I mean, we have a lot of powerlifting organizations now that are organizing meets uh, for similar uh, charitable organizations, and it's it's just a fantastic uh, message to bring in it. And you're really doing it uh, nearly globally um, with your reach, which is awesome. Yeah, yeah I, I can, I can, I'm sure I can uh, speak for Chris and I that we'd be happy to uh, be your left coast connection here on on getting that going. I'm going to take you up on that then. All right. All right. Feel free to. So uh, I want to switch gears just a little bit because you mentioned in there, um, I, I got the word wrong, but you, uh, it, it was, uh, you know, I don't want to be a douchebag or like, you know. Scumbag. 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 Exactly. You got the part right. Just it, a different it, time. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but, uh, you know, talk about, you know, walking the walk. You know, you were in a tough spot and you changed your life. But look at where you're at now. I mean, literally, you're like. Your gym is like two blocks off of Fifth Avenue in New York, right? And you're you're a celebrity trainer. You're on the Today Show. You've got your own program, you know, your own TV show. You've got like all this stuff going that you that you created yourself as, you know, starting doing like, you know, like you said, laying brick, you know, 15 years ago, basically, right? And uh, so, you know, how do you, let's talk about, you know, the... The, the business of fitness, how did you make this happen? You know, we have a lot of, you know, our followers are a lot of like, you know, gym owners or, you know, practitioners that own their own practices, this stuff. And like, you know, how do you reach people? How do you get out there? Um, talk, talk a little bit about this process of creating what you created, because it's it's pretty phenomenal what, what, what you have in front of you right now. 
Well, again, thanks for, you know, th thanks for the kind words. It's funny because to tell you the truth, um, and, and this is, you know, it's got the chills even as I said this, is God honest from the bottom of my heart, is I don't feel successful. I think that's part of what, um, part of what continues to drive me because no matter what I've achieved or no matter what type of resume I've built up, so to speak, um, I, I just feel like there's always a next level that I want to get to. So I never really have had a moment, and it's funny because uh, you know even when friends tell me I need to you know relax or go on vacation, you know it's like these are all things I know they're important, and trust me when I get to the breaking point I get away, but um, it, it's it's very hard for me to do that because I, I I don't ever feel like you know I don't know what I don't know what the fin I'm running a marathon uh, at a sprint pace with a moving finish line. So I don't know where the end is, but I know that there's always more. And uh, no matter what happens, I, I trust me, I have these moments where I, I'm like, how did a schmo like me get to this point? Because I look at people out there um, you know, who, are, who are you know, just so smart and, and they've done these incredible things and then you know, I just don't necessarily even see myself in, in, you know, in the same light. Um, so I, you know, anything I, I am about to say, I say, I mean, honestly, with the utmost humility. Um, that doesn't mean I'm not cocky occasionally, but I'm I'm a humble cocky guy. <laughs> I, I, I got you. I, I, I got you on that. Yeah. <laughs> but never satisfied, which is which never is never satisfied. It's, it's interesting, yeah, for sure. Yeah. And and it's not never satisfied. Like I'm like I'm dissatisfied with life. It's that right, right. Wow. What's the next goal? Yeah, we just did this. What's next? How right. exciting that I, you know, you see so open one gym, you want to have two more. You know, you have five gyms, you want to go to 10. Um, you know, it's funny because as a matter of fact, uh, right now, um, I have a, a company that, aside from Halvey Life, I own uh, a few other companies. And um, I have a company called HL Gym Design and Management Group, uh, which does primarily uh, uh, build outs of uh, residential fitness centers, uh, some some private homes as well, but generally commercial work. And uh, then we also have maintenance contracts throughout the city. And um, I um, I noticed an area that um, that really uh, uh, needed some uh, some TLC in our industry, and that's risk management. So I actually have a program that is very uh, that is launching very soon, um, actually by end of year. Uh, with one of the world's largest insurers, as a matter of fact. Um, I can't give you too much more information about that right now because I'm sure I'd be violating some agreements that I have in place. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, so that there's always more things. Like, I never thought I'd end up in risk management. Um, it's actually the last thing. <laughs> you know, I gave me a list of things about where I'd end up. But um, so, so deconstructing, um, you know, kind of how I've, uh, how I've gotten here, um, I'd say that one of the things that, um, you, you know, and this is along the lines of what I was just saying is you have to be open to stuff. Uh, and uh, I know that sounds um, sophomoric and, and, and very simplistic, but I think that a lot of business owners, um, and, and by the way, if you're a, 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 an individual, you know, uh, independent personal trainer out there, you're a business owner. And if you don't start thinking about yourself as a business owner, there's one thing I can guarantee. You're not going to own your business much longer. You're going to have to go work for somebody else. So uh, number one is always think about everything you do is yourself being the business. You are your business. You are your product. That's number one. Let's get that one out of the way. Uh, but then um, this being open uh, concept is I think a lot of business owners get uh, tunnel vision and they get very locked in to what they're doing. So, um, you know, maybe – Hey, I'm going to go open a powerlifting gym. Maybe that you know, maybe the market that you're in has an opportunity for a powerlifting gym to succeed. But if you you know broaden your scope just a bit, and that doesn't mean kill your brand and all of these other things that some schmo is going to tell you you're doing. But if you are open to expanding in areas that still uh, have integrity for you, integrity is a big word for me uh, in in a, in a global sense. Uh, but if you if you venture into areas where you still have integrity uh, in what you do, I think it only increases the chances for your success. And that's something that I've done over and over and over and over. And trust me, there was a point in time where it was like, hey, I do this and this is all I do and this is all we do and this is what the brand is and this is what the business is. And as soon as I started, because I had great mentors, tell me to ease off of you know being such a, you know, 
not, I would not even say hard ass, but tight ass, you know, and just kind of let it go a little bit and, and be open to some other things that I'm being approached with. Um, it really blew things open for me. Uh, heck, I mean, when I got, um, the, the I, I never thought about going into television. Okay. And it's funny because now the reason I'm, 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 uh, you know, I'm headed back out to LA. We mentioned before we started, um, you know, I'm headed out to LA later this month is I've a number of TV opportunities on the table right now. And I was not someone who was like a frustrated actor or anything like that. And then I decided to become a trainer. I was someone who was genuinely passionate about fitness because I felt like it saved my life. And that's why I went and, and I did what I did. But um, I, started, I started having to do, I was a managing director of uh, this pretty exclusive health club here in New York City. And I was doing local TV segments were, were, and national segments promoting the club. And uh, I got a call out of nowhere in 2009 from someone claiming to be from the show The Biggest Loser. And my first thought was like, all right, which one of my friends is this and what's the punchline? <laughs> <Yeah. right?" laughs> because like, I don't buy this for a second, right? And uh, it turned out to be totally legit. They had scouted me and uh, for two years in a row, I was literally in the final five that got packaged uh, to, uh, to NBC. Um, it didn't work out either one of the years, but it led to many other great opportunities. And um, interestingly enough, my gut instinct at the time was, there's no way I'm doing that show. I'm not a TV guy. This is not what I do. I'm not a Biggest Loser trainer. I'm a serious guy. I'm a science guy. And if I had had that mentality, if I had remained as hard-headed, I don't know if I would have had the opportunity to bring, in my opinion, what is you know evidence-based, scientific, real fitness into the lives of homes of people living in Egypt and Tunisia and Romania and Saudi Arabia and places that I, you know, I don't have the ability to go visit. Uh, you know, I don't think I would have ever had that opportunity. So you have to be open to all of these different avenues that life presents you as long as you feel, again, like you can maintain integrity. So going back to that idea of- So, so Jeff, I, I, don't yes, lose, I, I don't wanna lose your train of thought here, but I wanna, weigh, I wanna weigh in for a second and say, you know, I think that's an important cornerstone that also ties in like with what we're doing, which is as long as you're true to yourself, you can do a lot of different things. Like as a, as a business here at Kabuki Strength, you know, we're involved with baseball, football, basketball, Olympic throwing sports, like the list goes on and on, but we never pretend to be something that we're not. But if we just said, oh, well, we're power lifters, we're just only going to be involved with power lifting that would shut us down significantly where we go, you know what? We can help people be better. We can improve their shoulder health. We can improve their hip health. We can do, we can do all these things that relate to strength. And I think that's exactly what you're saying. Like what are the other opportunities out there that you've got to be open to that aren't necessarily, if just think about how can you be true to yourself and still be involved in those markets? Right? I mean, is that a hundred percent. And I mean, look, look at, look in the mirror, look at what you're doing. Um, there's someone who walked the walk as an athlete who continues to walk the walk as an athlete. Um, and, uh, you know, you're someone who's on the product side, you have a facility, you've got an incredible new website, you know, so you've, you've branched out into all of these areas. It's not like you said, no, I'm not doing a website. That's not what I do. I'm not a web guy. I'm not going to say, you know, and you also didn't say, no, I'm not going to do products. That's selling out. If you do products instead, what you probably said to yourself is, I'm going to make a kick-ass product that I myself would use. So I think that that's a lot of where, you know, where this turbulence comes from. That it's, It doesn't mean selling out and it doesn't mean doing something uh, just to make a quick buck. It means there's nothing wrong with being successful. There's nothing wrong with being profitable. But uh, the same thing, it's, so it's, with integrity. it's also incredibly rewarding, though, because, like, the amount of people that you can reach, and I know you're in the same position around the globe, like – you know, Brandon, I know you get the emails and, oh, yeah. and stuff as well, or the comments across social media. Like we're, we're impacting people around the world, like getting them, you know, moving better out of pain, like all these things. Cause you promote very similar practices to what we do. And, uh, that's just like, if we just like focused on like, this is what we do, we'd never have that reach. We'd never be able to impact the people that we, that, that, that we do around the world. And you can't like, that feels good. I mean, there's a lot of detractors if you're, if you're a, you know, a big personality or have a big presence and stuff like that. And I know you get the same thing, Jeff. We've actually had some conversations on the side about this, <laughs> but, uh, but you know, it, it, it makes up for it when 
you're able to do that. Like you said, you're you're reaching people in Tasmania and Romania, and like you, you just threw through the list. I mean, that's does that not feel great? Like it, it that's not that is not selling out. No, it's and it's the axiom times. that you know, do do what you love, you know, and if you really love what you're doing, you're gonna make a living out of it. I mean, it, we started this as a hobby, and uh, it turned into a business that and, uh, mostly because we just are passionate about it and we love it, and uh, all of a sudden it's a it's an opportunity to uh, to do what we love and still feed our families. Yeah, I mean that's that's the same page that I'm on, I, and I think that. Uh, you know, I, I get, I'm lucky because I get to interact with um, a lot of fitness professionals who are going through sort of like these growing pains of like, okay, you know, I've built up a lot of clients and, you know, they, they, they feel that, um, I've even heard comments like, uh, you know, oh, the bank's never going to give someone like me money to start a business or um, they, they don't see themselves being that, that person. And it's like, unless you're open to being that person, unless you see yourself is that person who can put together a business plan. And if you don't know how to put together a business plan, go find someone. There are, there are resources out there for free, you know? Um, so you have to be open to being that person. And then if, when you have that, that, um, that open, oh, openness and that integrity and that direction and hopefully the drive, you can literally do anything. I mean, you wake up every morning beating your chest, feeling like Superman, um, that doesn't mean you don't have your bad days too. I mean, look, <laughs> you guys <laughs> check me on a good day. I'm just kidding. I have bad days too, like everybody else does. But the truth of the matter is that um, when you have that focus and you have um, what some might call grand goals, uh, <laughs> it uh, it helps you know exactly where you're headed. And then it doesn't ma- be, it, it doesn't become a matter of can I. It's how how can I, and. Um, and that just changes everything. And, and there's always opportunity there. And um, I actually wanted to segue this, if, if you don't mind, to um, an, another you know, sort of related uh, insight that I've had in, in terms of being open is one of the things that I've looked at that's helped me grow uh, across the businesses that I own. Because I, I have a consulting firm. I produce seminars. I've got this gym design and management group. I've got this risk management business. One of the things that's helped me grow more than anything else is my metaphor of the sawmill. If you own a sawmill, your primary product is lumber, but you know what? There's a ton of sawdust on the floor and there's somebody out there who's gonna pay a pretty penny for that sawdust because they need it. So what you perceive to be waste or you you perceive to be this excess of what you're doing is usually something that's monetizable. And um, one of the best ways to grow, I think for any business owner, and especially right now I'm really speaking to the small and mid-sized business owner is to um, is to figure out what your sawdust is. What do you do on a daily basis? What are you great at? I mean, the low-hanging fruit here is to very simply say, "Look, if uh, you know if you're writing, if you're already sitting down to write programs for clients that you see in person, why not sit down and write programs for people that live on the other side of the country, the other side of the world? You're already sitting down and doing programming. I'm assuming you know what you're doing. We covered off integrity." And now we're going to cover off openness again, because once again, it's going to be like, well, I don't do that. I don't do online training. And I, I only work with people one on one. My question is, well, why not? And what might it look like if you did? So it's a matter uh, of figuring out how do you do it? Well, I love that sawdust analogy as well. So if we can put that into a practical sense, you know, every personal trainer entering the industry for the first time, you know, I, I, I think you would agree with this. The most common thing that they say they want to work with is athletes. You know, I want to work with athletes. I'm like, uh, okay, you know, that's great. But they, that's, that's, that's such a, a narrow scope and you're probably not even well equipped to deal with that. But everyone, as soon as they en- enter the industry, at least in my experience, um, has always wanted to work with athletes. They want to work with world champions, NFL players, NBA, you know, and they don't realize where they can really help people. And even when we look at success of the athletes, even if, if you ha- happen to work with them, success feels the same no matter what you accomplish. You know, it's all the, it's, it's all the exact same. It doesn't matter who you're working with. You can impact someone positively um, regardless. And, and so identifying those areas, I think, is is so important for people to understand. I had a conversation with even uh, one of our gym members here, and he's like, well, how do I how do I get started with, with coaching athletes? I'm like, well, have you coached anyone? You know, and, and it's, it's you, you got to start somewhere, and you, you got to really uh, see maybe some of the finer points and areas that you really can help. 
it honestly feels the same when you deliver results to somebody. It doesn't matter who they are at what level. It's sexy to say I want to deal with a with a with an NFL, you know, you know, you know, yeah. starting player. But when you deliver results to anyone and it changes their life, like yeah. That's rewarding. That feels freaking awesome. That well, is your job. That's yeah. your life. That's like amazing. One of my favorite uh, business books is entitled Think and Grow Rich. You probably have read that before, Jeff. I think it was W. Clement Stone. And so I think it says, whatever the mind can conceive and believe, it can achieve. And that's what we're talking about is, you know, conceive it. If you can think about it and if you believe you can do it and picture yourself doing it, you'll get there. All right. I've got a quick story to say. I, I'm, this is completely off topic, almost, but I have to share it. So I used to work in the window and door industry. And I worked for a company called Jailwin. <laughs> and we made a lot of sawdust. And what we did is we connected plants right off of every sawmill that took all the sawdust and compressed it into door panels. <laughs> and it was literally, we would joke about it because it was printing money. It was printing money <laughs> for the company. It was ridiculous. We made so much money. Uh, so basically every like, Every steel, like most interior doors, like in the in, in the country, are actually like produced basically for free, and uh, because they're the, these you know basically door plants connected off that. So your analogy is a hundred percent spot on. It's That's something that I did like twenty years ago. Literally, but like, like, I, I have to share it because like I was there. <laughs> I you know, you know something I I love that because it's it's not you know. It isn't just some random metaphor. It actually no, it's reality. <laughs> now it's reality. And I can I can, now I can say Chris can back me up on this one. <laughs> no, but, we should yeah. Yeah, no, I'm sorry, but I, I think that you know the idea of that sawdust though is uh, is so important actually to you know to the point that um that Brendan was making just a, a, a moment ago too, is that um, yeah, you know what? Everybody gets caught up uh, in our industry with wanting to train athletes or you know, um, look, I already been there, done that with the celebrity trainer thing. Like, you know, to tell you the truth, like probably shouldn't even say this, but I, I don't care that much about that. You know, I, it's, it just, actually I have no problem saying that. I don't care that much. I really don't like, it was cool. Um, and I've, I've worked with a lot of A-listers, a lot of athletes. Um, I still work with a handful of them, but, um, that's not, uh, you know, th that validation is not what makes me feel good. Um, and, I, and I would say to all the, the trainers out there who want to work with pro athletes right off the bat, like, honestly, you want to you want to be a stud? Go work with someone like my mom and help her lose 20 pounds and help her knee feel better and help her, you know, be able to just get through her day without any pain and moving better and help. Maybe even show her that she can get strong, you know, so her something that she doesn't believe she can do. And uh, you've earned my respect. It's, it's a lot... Uh, it's a lot more difficult, in my opinion, to work with someone like that than it is to work with someone who's either genetically gifted uh, with, uh, you know, with their uh, athletic uh, prowess or someone who's genetically gifted with, with their aesthetics. Um, you know, really doesn't take, I can tell you this personally, it doesn't take much to make, you know, a beautiful actress look that much more beautiful uh, on a screen. Uh, or even when you're working with an athlete, look, any good strength coach will tell you what's the number one job of a strength coach working with an athlete. Did I stump you guys? You, 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 oh, that was a question? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Improve Don't hurt them. Don't in, hurt them. Keep them injury yep, free. Yep, exactly. Injury free. Job. Yeah. Yep. So, um, you know, because because I think everybody gets caught up with performance and the cool stuff they can do with an athlete. And it's like, look, if that athlete's making millions of dollars a year, yeah, you no. get them better. You look to bulletproof them, but you better not screw them no, up in the actually, process. We work with a lot of strength and conditioning coaches in um, pro and college sports. And that is the number one lesson that they always say. Like our job, number one job is to make sure we don't injure the athletes. Yeah. You know? And that's our, our that's, job isn't to take them from a 550 pound squat to a 600 pound squat. Like we want to improve their strength, but we cannot injure them. Right. Yeah. I mean, it's one of the most overlooked things. And, um, you know, I think that people get, uh, look, this is another business one too, is, um, you know, don't get ca too caught up in numbers. Um, a lot of times numbers are an ego game and they really don't translate to performance. So, you know, talking about that athlete that maybe you want to take from a 550 pound squat to a 600 pound squat in doing so, is the risk worth, and this is something I'm sure you assess, is a risk worth 
what his ultimate performance is going to be on the field. And uh, I think as uh, business owners, a lot of times these are questions we need to ask ourselves when we think about money that we're spending, money that we're investing in our businesses. Uh, look, is it better to have um, you know some beautiful marquee location, uh, for instance, with all of the latest and newest equipment? Yeah, but that might not be the best way. That that might not be the best way to start. It might not be necessary. And um, you know those numbers become an ego game. At the end of the day, no one cares about how much you pay in rent. The only one who should care about that actually is you. You know, um, I can tell you here in New York City, it's it's a lot of money. You know, and uh, trust me, it keeps me up at night. Yep. But uh, <laughs> no, that's actually I get that question a lot from people going, you know, like I'm interested in starting my own facility. How do I go about it? What size? Because everybody wants to have like the premier place, the go-to place, the da 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 da. And it's like, I've got to invest so much, I've got to take out these loans, and my response is always, grow with the business. Absolutely. Grow with the business. Like, and you don't expensive. need that fancy stuff. And, and we go through this in our seminars too. Like, one of the things I hit home with is, like, we're going through some fancy stuff that's gonna help improve your athletes, it's gonna help you improve your performance, but the most rewarding thing is gonna be when you get that grandmother in and she's in pain, her back hurts, and she can't pick up her grandkid. She can't even bend over to the floor. And you teach her to reach down there and deadlift that 35 pound kettlebell in your first session. And she picks it up with no pain and she feels great. And she realizes that she's gonna be able to pick up her granddaughter that she couldn't have done two days ago. And she's got a tear running through her eye, out of her eye. You know, like that, that is what we do. You know, it, it, in the end of the day, like what we do, impacts people's lives. All the stuff in the gym, that's all to improve the quality of your life. And, and I think a lot of people miss that. You know, a big fundamental of what we say is we, you know, live better through strength. Live better through strength. Doesn't that's necessarily mean you need to set an all-time record. You know what? <laughs> that is not on everybody's game plan. <laughs> I'll tell you that right now. No. That's but, a good segue for the next question I, I have for Jeff. Jeff, I know you did a seminar, I think it was in New York State, where you were on a panel talking about the national epidemic of obesity. Um, t let's, t let's talk about that. What are you doing about it, and what should we be doing about it in the, in the uh, fitness industry? How can we get a handle on it? So what you're referring to is actually uh, Michelle Obama's Let's Move campaign, uh, which I was invited to join back in uh, 2011. So I, I've been very active locally uh, as well. Um, you know, I'm active on, on, on a local front uh, and on a national front. And, um, you know, the reason the national front is appealing to me is just I have a lot more reach. You know, there are a lot more lives I can touch for that sheer reason alone. There's no reason why anybody listening to this should think, oh, if it's not national, it's not enough. If you could just manage your town or a section of your town or just, you know, the third graders in one school in your town, um, you're doing more than most people will ever do in their entire lives. So I would commend just that effort alone. Um, but I was, uh, I was actually uh, um, asked to join Michelle Obama's Let's Move campaign, and I did some pretty amazing stuff. Um, first, firstly, in, in Newark with, uh, with then Newark Mayor Cory Booker, he's now a senator. Uh, and, um, and, uh, I've gone on from there to do, um, you know, to do a lot of stuff, uh, you know, really across the country, both in terms of public health advocacy and then also consulting. And, um, I think, um, you know, I think when we look at our, uh, obesity, uh, epidemic, especially childhood obesity, that, uh, one of the, one of our greatest problems we have right now um, it's, you know, I actually just like two weeks ago had, uh, someone make a comment to me like, you know, kids are so lazy these days or so, something like that. And they're referring to like 10 year old kids. And it's like, look, 10 year old kids are not lazy. 10 year old kids follow cues. And those cues come from their parents. They come from their religious leaders. They come from their teachers. That's where it comes from. So instead of pointing the finger, uh, which is by the way, always a very convenient thing to do. We really need to take a, a good hard look in the mirror and look at what examples we're uh, setting for our youth. I can tell you that some of the best programs that I've been involved with across the countries had the biggest levels of buy-in from the teachers and the principals of those schools. And many people are shocked by this because they think, oh, you know, kids make fun of teachers, they think the principal's a jerk, and they, 
guess what? No matter what they say, they take their cues from the adults around them. And I think that uh, you know anybody uh, who's listening to this, um, who is an adult, and I would presume almost everybody is an adult, has a genuine opportunity to impact a kid's life by just showing them how to live. And uh, you know, if you uh, are you, if you're someone who embraces um, keeping your body in shape, which I believe also, you know, just to touch on one of your points, keeps the mind in shape. Look, look, like here, our our uh, motto is raise the bar, and uh, that doesn't just mean you know over your head while you're working out. That that means having a higher standard for yourself and setting a higher standard for others. That's that's all that that means. And um, I think that uh, that if we start to look at ourselves, and I've, I've kind of gone very macro on this, but each and every one of us starts to look at ourselves uh, like a leader, which we are. We all lead others. We're all an example to someone, whether you think you are or you're not. This will have this positive impact, this ripple effect. And um, right now, unfortunately, I don't think that the adults uh, in this country are doing the job that they could, quite frankly, with kids. So I think a lot of it really comes back to us. Um, and uh, I don't know if I've gone too macro on your question now. Have I, Rudy? <laughs> no, no. I, go, yeah. go where you want to go. I, yeah. I, I want to know what winds your watch, and I can tell that that's, that's it. Yeah, I mean, it's, um, you know, that's, that's really outside. You know, for me, I can, look, when I did the, um, the initial run of, uh, of, of the, um, it was called Let's Move Newark Hour Power. And uh, that was the Newark run uh, of my program that we did back in uh, 2011. Um, you know, I invested uh, tens of thousands of dollars in that program uh, of my own money. This was something I just was passionate about that I wanted to do. And um, this was not a business choice. You know, there, there were actually, it would have been a terrible business choice. And it still is, would be a biz terrible business choice because I can't really set any revenues against it. But it was something that... Um, Sometimes you just got to feed your soul with what you do too. And um, if, if that's missing, then all of the other stuff um, starts to just fall away and, and, just, and just become not important. And I think you just get sort of, um, you know, you, get, you, you become hollow from the, you know, just like inside out. You know, I think one of the best examples of this are you know, our folks, and I'm not demonizing Wall Street by any means before I get internet trolls jumping on me about that. But when you think of, the Wall Street type who's really just thinking about uh, how much money can I make, you know, or profit maximization. You're thinking about that person who's driven by only one single factor in life, and that's why they're so miserable. That's why, you know, every day they're hitting the bottle by five o'clock, if not earlier, and they're just not very happy people. I think we need to look outside of our businesses sometimes too to find these other uh, uh, other ways that we can take what we're doing already and enhance the lives of others. And uh, in doing so, really enhance the lives of ourselves. One of the most important questions I think anybody can ask themselves is what can you contribute to the world? What do you want to contribute to the world? What impact do you want to have? So I think uh, you're, hitting on, you're hitting the nail on the head for you right there. So. Yeah, absolutely. You, you've obviously had a, an, a, you have an amazing story yourself as a, as a businessman and you know, really as a person. And you, you've impacted the lives of thousands. Um, you know, for that for that for that trainer, for that coach, or or for that person wanting to make a difference or wanting to put their foot into the industry and make a, a, a difference, um, what do you think some of the the beginning steps for them are um, outside of, of just doing it? You know, because we know that that's a big one is is just is just doing it. Um, but but how can they know um, what what direction or how can they um, know for themselves what to do? Here's my, I'll give you an anecdote to answer that, that question. When I, you know, I hooked the hard left into fitness out of actually another, uh, another industry that I was working in. And I did it solely because I myself was that person who burnt out chasing the dollar. And um, it, I took a huge hit financially and uh, I was, uh, I ended up uh, from making, uh, you know, a very nice six-figure salary to making $8 an hour on the, on the floor of crunch uh, here in the city. And um, all I cared about was not, <laughs> as much as, <laughs> as, much as the, the financial dire straits I was in, I really, at that point in time, did not care about money. Uh, my primary driver was to be the best trainer that I could and to train as many people as I possibly could 
every single day, um, honest to God. And what that translated into uh, was becoming the busiest trainer at that crunch location. And uh, people just assumed I was the best because I was so busy. Uh, little did they realize that most of the people I was working with, you know, nobody wants to do those initial uh, freebie, uh, you know, everybody, I don't know if they still do this, but when you sign up like at Crunch, you used to get like three free training sessions. Yeah. None of the training staff there wanted to do the freebies. They were like, ah, it's a waste of time. They're never going to sign up with me. And I saw it as like, man, I, I get to work with all these people and I'm going to learn every single time. And I love what I'm doing. I'd much rather be doing that than, you know, putting away dumbbells or just doing floor hours and hanging out and it, that's just a waste of time, but there were so many people who were more than happy to do that, to just completely eat up the clock as much as they could between you know the clients that were that were paying them. And uh, I told the front desk, express his verbis, send me all of the free training sessions. I am more than happy to do them. And I didn't have like an agenda doing this. I just wanted to train people. So um, you know to to the folks out there, who are just getting started, I would say busy is better than profitable when you first start. Don't worry about how much you're making per hour. I would really look at just getting as much experience as you possibly can under your belt, getting as much knowledge as you possibly can. Um, you know, the KMS site is a great place to get a lot of this very vetted uh, um, you know, scientific knowledge. There are other resources out there that you probably should be going to, you know, as well. But you have to look to the leaders in the field. You know, the Chris Duffins, the Charlie Weingroffs, Dean Somersets, the Gray Cooks. You know, all of these guys out there um, who have these incredible knowledge sets, and uh, and start taking those pieces. And you have to practice them with someone. You know, so before you're that expert or before you become who you already think you are. You got to pay your dues, man. You know, you don't just get there by saying that's who you are, saying you're a high-end personal trainer who only works with pro athletes. Good luck with that. Go ahead. Hang that shingle up. See how many customers you have. It doesn't work that way. Go out there. Pay your dues. Train as many people as you possibly can, all shapes, sizes, flavors, and varieties. Get as much knowledge as you can, and then start worrying about how you're actually going to build the business itself. I wish yep. I could put that on repeat like five times. By the way. <laughs> so that rant was beautiful. We never, we never have all the answers. We never, you, you listed names and I know almost every one of those names personally and none of them believe that they have all the answers and they're always learning. Yeah. Um, and, 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 and you only learn by doing. I love hanging so, around people who make me feel stupid. You know, so, you know, when, when, when Chris, when you were here presenting, I'm watching you and I'm thinking to myself, oh my God, this guy no, knows so much more than I do, you know? <laughs> and it's, I love it, it's a great feeling. And I'm lucky enough that I have, I have friends right here in New York City, like Charlie Weingroff, you know? And like, look, we usually don't you know, talk shop and we go out to dinner and stuff like that, but sometimes we do. And he just drops like a few nuggets that by the way, honest to God, I don't even understand. So like, I'm like logging what he's saying so that I can then research, research it later. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> you know, but I'm not. So I, oh, so like, thanks Jeff, we're, we're getting uh, the high sign here from our uh, young Romanian director here that we only have a few <laughs> minutes left. So I think, I think there's so much more material that you have and we want to ask of you. So we're going to have to do this another time. The Absolutely. Jeff Halavy two uh, podcast on, uh, on strength chat. But uh, just to the, just to wrap up, is there is there a nugget that you want to leave us with here? Oh man, there's there's, there's honestly so many nuggets. Ask me to pick one. Um, you know something? I'll, I'll leave you guys with um, with something that really falls outside of the scope of um, of what we've talked about today. But um, it's a nugget that I like to leave um, with as many people as uh, I possibly interact with, and I'm interacting now with a new audience. And uh, it's another opportunity to leave uh, your audience with this nugget. And it is so incredibly off topic, yet so incredibly on topic in a lot of ways that this is what it is. Depression exists in the past, anxiety exists in the future, and happiness and peace exist in the present. That's it. That's all I've got. <laughs> that's, okay. that's, that's, that's beautiful, Jeff. Give it to us one more time. Yeah. Give it to us one more time. Depression exists in the past, anxiety exists in the future. Peace and happiness exist in the present. Great. I might just write that one down, Jeff. Yeah, thank you. <laughs>
I'll thank, get it on a t-shirt for Thank you, you uh, so much for joining us today, Jeff. We appreciate yep. it. And we'll circle back uh, again before too long and, and pick up where we left off. So, I'm honored, guys. Thank you so much. Before you go right. today, Jeff, where can some of our listeners find you at? Uh, usually in a hotel room somewhere. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Chris can relate to that one. Uh, they can look if you want to hit up. Uh, first of all, uh, I'm now using Instagram as my primary means of interacting uh, with folks. I just it is what it is. It's it's where most of my interactions take place. So if I don't get back to you on Twitter, sorry. Facebook, same thing. I'm just not big on those platforms. Um, I happen to love Instagram right now, especially with their new stories. By the way, I, one of my stories for today is now a uh, part of this interview. Um, I was sneaky. I, I kind of recorded it from <laughs> <laughs> I saw your phone like enter the stream yeah, exactly. for a little bit. Yeah. Cheater. <laughs> but, so I'm on Instagram, Jeff.Halaby. Um, I do respond to um, non-creepy uh, uh, questions and, and you know message requests. So if you're asking me to uh, how ticklish my feet are or something weird like that. Send you my songs. Um, yeah, you're not getting a response. So <laughs> But if you ever, if you have a legitimate question, I'd love to answer your question. I, I do this on a regular basis every single day now, uh, nearly answering fitness questions. You can always go to jeffhalaby.com, uh, and you can always go to uh, halabylife.com as well. If you're in the New York City area, I love guests. You want to come by? You want a deadlift? I don't do. Uh, the problem is, you know something though. I don't do whiskey and deadlifts. I do. I do tequila instead. So, okay, well, so <laughs> we'll have to get a shirt made up wanna, for you. As long as it doesn't want to come back up. By the way, Jeff is uh, getting close to a six hundred pound deadlift. Is that correct? Yeah, I, I actually, you know, I'm probably over it right now. Um, I just haven't tested a single. Um, and and it's funny now. Now that I'm pretty sure I'm over six. I want seven. What's so. next? It's funny how that. It's funny. How Never that satisfied. Works. Funny how that works. <laughs> Never satisfied. All right, Jeff. It's been an absolute pleasure. I'm. I'm really glad you uh, joined us uh, for the day uh, here on Strength Chat, and uh, looking forward to chatting with you in the future. Thank you so much. Later, guys.